God whose never failing providence errs in one detail of history. Give to us those good things and incline to Christ centeredness and withdraw those things, the devices and desires of our own minds that we make as idols with the power, might, and cleansing operation of the merits of Christ. Amen. Well, we're back with Professor Hughes again on faith and works, Cranmer and Hooker on justification. And we started in our last uh, segment. We're picking up here with the brief on John Wycliffe, the Augustinian, who has said that the treasury of merits, the accumulation of the excessive worthiness of saints, he calls that a lying fiction of a limitless treasury of the super arrogatory merit of the church triumphant, which the Pope is empowered to distribute. We commented on that in our last segment. We're moving on here with Prof Hughes. The influence of Wycliffe's thought and example continued strong in the hearts of the followers of the Lollards who were eager students of the English translation of the Bible initiated by their master and who maintained a solid, though mostly quiet presence in many different parts of the land. A quiet presence because they were persecuted and went underground. From time to time, there were prosecutions of those of their number who ventured to be outspokenly critical of what they regarded as ecclesiastical abuses. The Lollards formed an indigenous and not import, unimportant line that stretches back over a century and a half from Cranmer, from Wycliffe to Cranmer. <coughs> and we must note that it also fostered uh, the equivalent of the Lollards down in Bohemia and Prague with John Huss and others where those, and that would be absorbed, and with the Valdensians, would be absorbed into the Reformation. As A.G. Dickens, he's a famous Tudor historian, has stated, the ingredients of early Protestantism proved already numerous in the reign of Henry VIII. We may nowadays confidently ascribe the role of some importance on the popular level to the still vital force of Lollardy, close quote. Similarly, William Klebsch, he's a famous American historian of the early Tudor period uh, out at Stanford, his memory serves, that's where he's a professor, has declared that, quote, from the outset, the English Protestantism was shaped by the waning with Wycliffe fights whom it engulfed. Close quote. That Wycliffe was held in veneration and his teachings cherished for generations after his death by numbers of persons, some learned and exalted, many of a humble estate, is amply attested in the annals of the 15th century. By way of example, we give here the testimony of William Thorpe, who went arraigned before the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Arundel, in 1407, <laughs> spoke as follows, quote, quoting Thorpe, I believe they killed him. Satan was happy to see Christ defamed. And Christ was happy to have witnesses like Wycliffe. And William Thorpe. Thorpe's talking about Wycliffe here. Sir, Master John Wycliffe was holden a full many men, the greatest clerk whom they knew then living. And therefore, what he was named a passing ruling man and an innocent in his living. And therefore, men, great men, communed oft with him. And they loved so his learning that they wrote it busily enforce them to rule themselves thereafter. Therefore, sir, 
this aforesaid learning of Master John Wycliffe is yet holden, full of full many men and women, the most agreeable learning unto the living and teaching of Christ and his apostles, and most openly showing and declaring how the church of Christ hath been and yet should be ruled, and yet, it's important work, yet, in our time, in 1407, should be ruled and governed. Therefore, so many men and women covet this learning purpose through God's grace to conform their living like to this learning of Wycliffe. And so before all other men, I choose willingly to be informed of them and by them, and especially of Wycliffe himself, as of the most virtuous, godly, wise man that I have heard or ever knew. Here ends this glowing epitaph and tribute. And Wycliffe would say that all the praise and all the glory for any of these good spoken things, any good of his life was holy, the gift of God. That's Wycliffe, that's Augustine, that's St. Paul, that's the Bible. We now turn to John Colet, C-O-L-E-T, often put into the camp of uh, the late Renaissance, a Renaissance cleric and Englishman. Before the dawn of the 16th century, another powerful voice was raised in England. This was the voice of John Colet, who in 1497 began a series of public lectures on St. Paul's to the Romans and first epistle to the Corinthians. He was getting into the Greek as well, which attracted a large and enthusiastic audience. This was in English. St. Paul's was a cathedral church in London. These expositions by John Colet, churchman, which shunned the elaborate allegorism that had long fascinated the scholastic mind. In other words, he got into the text and let the text do the talking without an extraneous philosophy called allegory. We could liken in our own time to Gnosticism, Bardianism, and Boltmanianism. These expositions, which shunned the elaborate scholasticism, and explain the scriptural text in its natural, straightforward manner, have justly been described as, quote, a milestone in the history of Christian scholarship, close quote, and as marking an era in the history of religious thought in England. And there's Venerable Bede, who was a Bible man. Anselm wasn't terribly far behind him. Well, he was allegoristic, too, is my understanding. <clears throat> so this may be a bit of an overstatement. Bishop Elfric was a Bible man. In his subsequent career as dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, Collet's reputation as an outspoken and challenging preacher continued undiminished. It's important to add here that he was very, very popular. As the 16th century opened, he began this during the reign of Henry VII. A particular interest to us in this study is the clear manner in which he propounded the doctrine of justification by faith. This is all before Martin Luther. Everyone thinks Luther found justification by faith alone. He's one in the history of that doctrine, but he's not the initiator of that doctrine. It was with the firmest emphasis that he taught that a sinner is not justified at all by any supposed human merit, but solely by the freely given grace of God faith in Jesus Christ. Same thing Wycliffe taught. God, 
he affirmed, of his grace imparts himself to those who believe and trust him, who have also been taken and drawn away by him from unbelief, that they may trust in him, Christ, in him alone, and believe that by no other means, whatever, can they be justified than by divine grace. That's again, this is 1497, 20 years before Martin Luther nailed his theses to the famous door at Wittenberg. And John Collet, very important man in the history of the church, will raise the question, what did Thomas Cranmer know of John Collet? Collet knows Erasmus. What is going on here? The history of Abraham, as St. Paul shows, illustrates the truth that justification is by faith, not by works. Abraham, Collet declares, had testimony born of his righteousness. Before the works and ceremonies of the law were ordained, and it might be clearly taught that justification belongs not to those who do works under the Mosaic law, but to those who imitate the faith of Abraham. So I'll block that off. Accordingly, the apostle concludes that just that being justified by faith and trusting in God alone, men are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ and restored to grace that they may stand before God in themselves, remain sons of God, and look for the certain glory of the sons of God. We're going to interject here, step to the side from Cole's comment. How much, this is a question we have, how much did John Cole understand what the implications of this were for purgatory, prayers to the dead, the treasury of merits, works, salvation? We'll come back to John Collet here, for it is of the great love and grace of God towards us that we have been reconciled. It's sounding reformed. Otherwise, his son would not have died for us, even when we were ungodly and at enmity with God. Indeed, going on with Collet, it is God's will that his loving kindness and mercy and benefit should be acknowledged to proceed wholly and manifestly from himself, God, that men may have no room for either pride or idle questioning, we would add monetization of merits sold from the treasury of Rome, filling the treasury of Rome from the pockets of Christians in Europe and England, back to Colet, but may own that nothing is of themselves, but everything is from God. It sounds very much like Wycliffe. Now Philip Hughes says, to the same effect is the apostolic teaching that, quote, all things are done for men by the promise and free election of God. Whoa, whoa, election of predestination in John Collet, like Wycliffe, like Augustine, like Paul. Cranmer will be almost repeating what Collet says, back to Collet. They themselves contributing nothing towards that election, lest the counsel and person of purpose of God should seem to depend on the will and deeds of men. Whoa. I knew Cole was preaching in Romans 1 Corinthians. I've known that in the past. Professor Hughes is bringing this out with grand skill. That Cole was just simply sticking to the Pauline text 
of Romans and 1 Corinthians and letting the, as it were, unleashing the text, bringing forward the text before the eyes of men. And you can imagine sin-weary saints in London hearing this comfort and this joy, serious devout people realizing I know the law tells me to do A, B, C, D through Z. And I do try, but I always fail to keep them perfectly. How ever could I stand before an infinitely holy God? And here they are in St. Paul's. This would be the Cathedral Church of St. Paul's, the one that would be burned down. That's the fire of the 1660s and would be rapidly rebuilt into what we have today preaching this message of comfort and efficacy, the atonement's efficacy, definitive character. Wow. It follows then that whatever there is which affects the blessedness of mankind rests wholly upon the purpose and will and grace of God and that none can now truly say that he is saved except by grace. We've been talking in another series on saved by grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, is revealed in the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone, the, feet, the solas of the great reformation. Wow, this is pretty enlightening stuff from my former professor now deceased, Dr. Philip Hughes. It is not good works that can earn grace, but grace that begets good works. Justification comes first, then sanctification. Quote, we are not righteous through the observance of the law, says Cole, but we observe the good law because we are righteous just block that off if you give me a second here highlight the highlighters going otherwise expressed quote the love of God within us is kindled from God's love towards us and is begotten in us by a loving God that is simply stated but it's pregnant with potency hence it is by God loving us that we love him in return if it is true that there is nothing in man but the justest cause of death nothing to deserve grace but only to provoke wrath then it follows that man would be safe and sound must rest in the grace and love of God alone there is no dismissal of good works except only as the cause of a man's justification. <clears throat> the good works of a righteous living, however, should follow justification as a natural consequence. Our justification, John Cole asserts, is to the end that we should live righteously. I have another question. Did Luther know John Cole? I doubt it. That's a supposition. Uh, he would later be informed by one of the cardinals that this is Luther now, that he was basically following the teachings of Jean Hus. And Luther was a little um, tripped up by that, but he went out and did some research and came back and he said, yeah, I'm in the camp of Jean Hus. Jean Hus was in the camp of Wycliffe. So really, Wycliffe is the precursor to Luther. Cole is the precursor to Luther. Accordingly, this is John Cole, our justification precedes the righteous dealing which is an observance of the law. And we do not act righteously before we ourselves are righteous. Of our own human and carnal nature, we are all unrighteous, confessedly powerless to do anything aright. Though righteous deeds are enjoined upon us, what indeed is the use of enjoining precepts on the unrighteous 
unless we first make them righteous so that being made righteous, they may be able to keep them, these precepts of righteousness. Close quote. There is no question that the doctrine proclaimed by Collet was influential. His preaching, both at Oxford, 60 miles out to the southwest of London, and subsequently in London, drew large and eager crowds from all walks of life. And it is hard to believe that his emphasis on justification by grace alone was not a seed. It's hard to deny this, was not a seed which found lodgment in the minds of some who, after his death, would energetically expound this doctrine and insist on its importance for the spiritual renewal of the church. It is, for example, reasonable to suppose that William Tyndale, when he was an undergraduate at Magdalen Hall, must have been one of the hearers of Collet's Oxford Lectures. That's an interesting connection. The influence of Collet may perhaps be discerned behind the information given by John Fox that Tyndall was brought up from a child in the University of Oxford, where he, by long continuance, grew up and increased as well in the knowledge of tongues and other liberal arts, as especially in the knowledge of sacred scriptures. There are passages in the sermons of Bishop Hugh Latimer where an indebtedness to the preaching of Collet has been postulated. It also has been rightly pointed out concerning the articles alleged against Robert Barnes. He was the great Cambridgeensian, as I remember, maybe an Oxfordian. He was declared heretical in 1526, Bishop Fisher, Sir Thomas More, Archbishop uh, William Warham. They were after Robert Barnes. They'd kill him in 1540, under Cranmer's regency, I might add. But we're connecting here John Collet with William Tyndale and maybe Robert Barnes, who had been, I believe he was an abbot, the Augustinian Friary in Cambridge. At no point in the articles derived from Luther more than from Wycliffe or Huss or Collet. According to Erasmus, his close friend, Collet had read the writings of Wycliffe. That's an interesting addition there. And it is not entirely surprising that Collet was suspected and accused unsuccessfully by hostile spirits of profounding views sympathetic to Lollardism. We know that those of Lollard persuasion approved of his teaching, John Collet's teaching, and encouraged people to listen to his sermons. Latimer, in fact, when preaching in 1552, recalled the time when Dr. Collet was in trouble and should have been burnt if God had not turned the king's heart to the contrary. And this may be a good place to stop. We're again in this volume, Faith and Works, Cranmer and Hooker on Justification <coughs> by Philip Hughes. And we are, uh, it's dedicated to Bishop uh, Fitzsimmons Allison of Charleston, South Carolina. And we're talking about Wycliffe, and the Lollards. We just finished John Collet. Next time we'll talk about um, Thomas Bilney, another Cambridge man, who preached at St. Margaret's in Cambridge. George Joy, a collaborator, along with me at William Tyndale. All of this goes on before Cranmer begins to get a set of sea legs in the 1530s and 40s. And then we'll talk about Cranmer and the homilies, his homily on salvation. The 39 articles, or 42 articles, John Jewell dies in 1571, maybe the great jewel of the English church. And then finally, Richard Hooker. Let us close with prayer. Almighty God, you are the giver of all good gifts. 
and in the history of the church, you've lifted up these witnesses, these lights to your triune being. We praise you for these good gifts, these good teachers who lead and help us in the way of the pilgrimage on earth. In all of the glory and praise be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here ends this session.